Welcome to today's bioscience webinar. This webinar has the title HA fillers and fat grafting. My name is Konstantin Frank, and I'm more than happy to welcome you today. Together with me is Dr. Kotti and um, Dr. Schlaudraff. Um, I think all of you know both of them. Um, both of them have a decade long record when it comes to body contouring. And I'm more than excited to um, basically comment in between their talks, um, keep the discussion going. I think one of the really important points of today's webinar is also to work on this difference, when to use hyaluronic acid, when to use um, lipofilling. Um, and I think we're really, let's say, um, fortunate to have this possibility to discuss with them. Before I really start and kick it off and go through the program, um, I want to thank Bioscience, obviously, for organizing this webinar, especially Anna, who put us all together on the same table to discuss this really important topics in the next one and a half hours. So um, a couple of words about me before um, we um, go through the agenda and through the schedule for today. My name is Konstantin Frank. I'm a plastic surgery resident at Ocean Clinic in Marbella, where Dr. Kai is my boss. Um, I studied in Salzburg and Austria, and then um, also spent some time in the US, um, then started my residency at the University Hospital in Munich, and um, now finishing it off in the last months at Ocean Clinic in Marbella. Um, why do I speak for Bioscience? I speak for Bioscience because I think that they have a great product um, that I use on a daily basis. Um, I started working intensely, also um, scientifically with them one and a half years ago, and I'm super excited to share my insights into the common and daily practices um, of this product and how we can link this with the knowledge we have from body contouring surgery. So um, without further ado, I quickly want to introduce you the agenda that we're going to have today. The opening remarks are going to be over in a couple of seconds, and I will hand over to Dr. Schlaudraff. Um, he will talk about ISAP safety guidelines when it comes to gluteal augmentation, gluteal contouring, which I think is um, definitely one of the most important um, parts of today's webinar to really see how we can make this procedure safer. Then Dr. Cotti is going to take over and speak about patient selection, when to use hyaluronic acid, when to use fat grafting. Um, I'm going to speak a couple of minutes about the um, gluteal anatomy, the underlying anatomy of the regions that we're treating. And it's not going to be about the buttocks, but also a little bit about the hip tips. And then why and when you should choose the right product. Um, we'll then hear a little bit about injection technique, which I think is closely related to um, the rheology part that we're going to cover. And then obviously we'll close this up with some complication management discussion. So um, I'm really happy to hand over to Dr. Schlaudraff. Dr. Schlaudraff um, has his private clinic in Geneva. Um, he has decade-long experience in body contouring, and I'm more than happy to listen to his safety guidelines, um, which I think he co-developed as ISAP's treasurer the last years. Dr. Schlaudraff, um, screen, not stage, but screen is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Frank. I'm very happy to be here. I'm very happy to participate in this uh, webinar. I will share my screen and take you through the ICEPS guidelines. Um, basically, uh, as the representative of ICEPS in, in the role of the treasurer, I want to make you aware of the society in itself, but also want to make sure that you know what has been done in the field of fat grafting to the buttocks and also in, with patient safety guidelines for the injectables, most importantly, non-resorbable injectables. We will obviously not talk about this um, uh, in the proper effect in terms of all the, the complications. And um, in the role of the treasurer here, I will present Bioscience once again, um, who is a very uh, trusted partner of ISAPS within the program of the uh, gold uh, ISAP Global Sponsor Program, where we partner up with the industry in order to provide um, targeted education for the physicians and obviously co-develop also with the input of industry, patient safety guidelines and advice for patients, what to get as a treatment and what not. So as a mission of ISAPs, as you might know, being a member of the society, we, we're global leaders in aesthetics and we want our members to provide safe and effective procedures for the patients 
that combine an improvement of quality of life, but also at the same time as an organization, we want to inspire and nurture the education and towards excellent uh, in aesthetics. As you might know, we have 5,000 members in 111 countries, 84 national societies are part of our globalized alliance. And I think these are the outlets of communication in order to move what's most important for the patients, uh, to move the, the patient safety forward. We do this through webinars, the ICEPS Business School for our members, through our journal, the Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Um, we also have Med1, which is an e-learning platform with a, a wealth of information, tables, graphics, and certainly something that uh, our members should have a look at because it's really a lot of very pertinent information. And we have a residence program and a mentorship program. And with the mentoring, with these educational programs, we promote the patient safety also through a worldwide network of plastic surgeons. So if you treat a patient out of town, you can rely on having an ISEPS member in the home country of the patient. And if something has to be urgently looked at, you can obviously rely on that network and get that patient seen. We, ISEPS has developed a ISEPS revision insurance, which bears the cost for revision surgery if necessary. To, necessary. And obviously, we also have uh, quadruple ASF facility accreditations and the guidelines. So with the guidelines, we have developed two uh, important things already. And I think I will briefly start with the uh, FDA safety communication on non-resorbable fillers, especially injectable silicones, but also other non uh, resorbable fillers and their illegal use. And for the patients, the important thing is really to realize what is it that these can do. If you look at these uh, implications, once you have a uh, non-resorbable filler, both for face and body, they're considered unsafe. They obviously can uh, create significant complications, necrosis, infection, embolism, uh, if you have an intravascular uh, injection, they can lead to stroke and death and blindness. Um, and obviously, in situ, they will create chronic inflammation, granuloma, but also can be the cause of systemic autoimmune disease. Once they're injected into the breast, they obviously could be problematic to, to detect uh, any breast lesions and breast cancer and mammography. And... The products in question are obviously silicon, any kind of oils and silicon oils, PMMA and other non-resorbable products. None of them are approved by the FDA or anywhere else in the world. So it's strictly unethical and illegal use of, of uh, any kind of product. It might be industry grade silicon, for example, that are just injected by, by um, uh, those practitioners. So as a patient advice, basically these are the key messages. Never get permanent fillers. Ask your practitioner whether it's resorbable or not. Never buy fillers on the internet yourself or buy it from cheap providers and also ask your provider where they get their product from. Don't get treated by unlicensed providers. Never get fillers in a setting like a party, a, a gym, a fitness studio, or any kind of non-medical settings, because it's an indicator that these people have a little bag and just inject wildly wherever they can get hold of some patients that feel like I'm getting a bang for the buck. And obviously, as a patient, if you have signs of complications, get help, help quickly from your plastic surgeon or your practitioner and make sure to not... Uh, talk around the fact that you had permanent fillers, but to give them give out the proper information. Now, as safe alternatives for body and facial volumization, we have obviously the fat grafting. And Barari and Dr. Frank will talk about this later. And we also have HA as a resorbable filler. So these are the two safe options for the patients. 
And in regards to Fed grafting, there was another ISAP statement for patient safety, which was uh, uh, put through a combined and, and joint effort of several society, ASAPs, ISAPs, and ISPRES and IFATs, in order to make sure that we have a broad consensus on what are the be best practices for Fed grafting to the buttocks in particular. And the recommendations are as follows. Obviously, you want to inject into the subcutaneous space. This space in the buttocks is considered safe, which means that you always stay above the muscle. Never go with your injections intramuscular. Uh, as you might know, especially in Florida, the state has regulated the fat grafting to the buttocks also with a requirement for ultrasound monitoring. This ultrasound sound to guide and to guide and to visualize the tip of the cannula is recommended. Obviously, you should do fat grafting in appropriate approved and licensed facilities, and you need to ensure proper pre and post operative care, uh, obviously the consents and the explanations to the patients, and obviously you need to be trained to perform this well. Now, Bioscience as a company has, within the discussions and during the last work of really structuring everything, really did an, they did an enormous effort in terms of training academies, training programs, hands-on trainings to really make sure to structure the education and familiarize all the practitioners with proper way of using HA in the buttocks. As a quick reminder, and I'm sure we're going to dive deeper, deeper into the anatomy a little later, we obviously know where the uh, gluteus maximus is located. We know that the blood vessels are under the muscle, hence the conclusion that if we stay in the subcutaneous space, we're away from these blood vessels. We also know that the main trunks of the superior and inferior gluteal veins are found in on average within a 3.3 centimeter radius circle, located one third the distance from the mid sacral border to the greater tucranter. So there's anatomical landmarks. We know where the danger zone is and where the vessels are located. We obviously want to avoid patients with risk factors which are the usual risk factors for bleeding, hematologic disorders, anticoagulants, but also obviously if you already have a history of deep venous thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, or lower extreme varicosities, or a sciatic nerve compression, these all are patients where you should consider twice whether that's the right treatment for the patient altogether. As a technical clue for fat grafting, this is obviously an important point to make sure that you have the right position of the patient in terms of uh, injecting the, the patient altogether. We will talk about the angle and the depth of uh, injection, but also about a, a uh, phenomenon where basically we need to make sure that we actually, while we do the use of a cannula for the injection, and within the site that we very often don't have an intravascular injection in itself, but a laceration of the vein, and then a siphon functioning where fat, injected fat is then aspirated into the vein by the negative pressure. So it's not a direct injection, but most likely a kind of like the vein sucking in some fat. And for that, we have to make sure that we uh, reduce this phenomenon, which is actually the flexibility misguidance of the cannula. If you look at the, the picture, you see that the cannula in itself, due to the fact that the lure lock connection of the cannula to the syringe is quite flexible, if you don't control this and hence control the tip and the position of the tip in the tissues, you might think that you're above the muscle, but actually you will find yourself within the muscle. So this is a very important part. Obviously, as a conclusion, we want to inject superficially. We want to have an angle of injection from superior to inferior in order to make it easier to stay above the muscle. We want to use 
a bigger cannulas, do a retrograde injection and a fan technique injection. Again, if you come from above, you have much more of a need to stay above the muscle. If you inject from the buttock crease, the likelihood of finding yourself in the gluteus muscle close to the veins is actually much higher. So you want to spread either the fatty tissue or the hyaluronic acid in the sub -Q. Obviously, more superficial you get, more you want to fan out the product and want to distribute it within the tissue. If you're a little deeper, you can afford to do microboluses into the adipose tissue, but the bottom line of it stay above the muscle. And with this, I will uh, quickly hand over. I want to invite all of you to the next ISEPS World Congress in Cartagena, happening from June 11 to 15th. The super saver deadline is the 11th of January. So come to Colombia, do your inscription, and we'll see us there. And I'm sure there will be more uh, discussions and sessions about fat grafting and HAUs for buttocks there. Thank you very much. And I'll hand over back to Dr. Frank. Thank you, Dr. Schlaudraff, especially a really nice last picture on your slide. Um, hard to come compete with that view from your clinic. But um, aside from that, thank you so much for putting this, I think, so important safety measurements um, in, in such a concise manner. I think it can't be emphasized enough how much work ISAPS, uh, including you, um, has done to increase the safety of those procedures. Um, I'm not sure about the actual numbers. I don't know if, if you are, but I think the number of fatalities caused by BBLs, um, by, by gluteal contouring in general, have significantly decreased the last years. Is this correct? That is correct. There has been a, a huge surge. Firstly, obviously, the, the demand for a fat grafting to the buttocks in particular has risen extraordinarily in a very short time due to uh, social media influences which promoted this altogether. But it also has led, as always, to quite a lot of abuse. And there have been surgeons performing more than 30 BBLs in a week where you realize that there's no way that that person can actually do all the work themselves technically unless they don't, don't sleep anymore. And so don't eat. Delegation of, of uh, parts of the surgery and to also be fair, there has been quite a lot of work that has been done from an anatomy point of view, because they used to be surgeons who would even promote the intramuscular injections within the argumentation that they felt like the survival rate of the fat graft in the muscle is better than in the fatty tissue. But obviously it carries a very high risk of fatality. And when the initial work started, it was quite striking to what extent even experienced surgeons would say, I'm above the muscle and actually found themselves in the muscle. So I think the guidelines and especially the approach to the injection from above with the appropriate angle and if possible with ultrasound guidance, I think that provides the difference in safety and has reduced the, the fatalities. Thank you. I think those are, again, very relevant points. And um, it's nice to see how this road has, has led to a safer procedure these days. Now, um, I think we're, we're going to dwell on a little bit more um, Q&A and discussion later on. At this point, I want to, again, um, make you aware that there's a little Q&A box down there where you can type in your question, um, which will be happily answered by Dr. Schlaudraff, Dr. Kotti, or me after the webinar, or if we feel fit during one of the breaks in between the sessions. Now, um, I'm really excited to announce to you um, Dr. Kotti. Dr. Kotti um, practices in UAE, in Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Um, he's, I think, also another eminence that we all know when it comes to body contouring, to body contouring surgery, but also minimally invasive treatments. He wrote a book about um, contouring the breast. Um, he developed his own app also about different algorithms, how to tackle difficult breast augmentations. And um, I'm very happy to now Welcome you to, to our discussion round here. I'm really excited to hear your take on which patient to choose for HA, which patient to choose for lipofilling. Dr. Cotti, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Frank. Thank, uh, thank you, uh, Anna. Thanks uh, to Bioscience for the kind invitation. Uh, it's not easy uh, to talk about uh, fat versus hyaluronic acid 
uh, for uh, battery shapement and enhancement. And we're talking about it because now it's more and more trendy, it started like a dozen of years uh, ago, and even social media said the tone. Uh, now we have belfies, and it's like selfies, but people take uh, photos of their bot and post this uh, on Instagram, and it's become very trendy. And <clears throat> I think that uh, the this hypersexualization started with uh, the Sarah Bartman, uh, probably the earliest example of hypersexualization of a black female body. Uh, she was taken from her homeland to England to be put on display for her large hips and buttocks. And at that time, it was like uh, so exotic and so different uh, from, uh, from the people in England. And uh, yes, we are different, but also we follow trends. And uh, if you see the last century, we started with big and round uh, bots in the early 90s and step by step it turned flat, curvy, very curvy and then super fit. And we came to the supermodels bot in the 90s. And I think that all of you, you remember this famous photo of Kardashian with this champagne glass on her butt. And uh, it was like a booming <coughs> uh, also of uh, BBLs. Uh, and now it's coming back a little bit to more natural and normal shapes. But for years, we get this hourglass uh, uh, demand in our consultations. And like Coco Chanel was saying, la mode se démode, le style jamais. This is what I'm always telling to my patients. Don't follow trends. Try to stay natural. Try to stay uh, uh, to, to just fulfill beauty and not only trends. And uh, before injection, uh, it's very important to, to do a good assessment. I think that the assessment is the key. Of course, the right indication, which patient you will uh, choose for fat grafting or for hyaluronic acid. If you go for the hyaluronic acid, which product you will choose, especially in bioscience, we have several products that we can use uh, for this uh, purpose. What is the technique? We have different techniques and uh, a lot of people use different uh, techniques, rather balls or the retrograde final technique and how to do the right follow-up. And this will require some expertise and some experience. We are different and people are different and the good assessment is the key. So we all know these different shapes from A to B and I think that that's the way to talk about it. So I'm not going to talk about it a lot, but it's very important to, to, to check the anatomy of the bones. We are different, some are tall, some are short, and also to check the, the tonicity of the muscles. Some do a lot of workouts, some not. And the most important thing is the fat deposition. So the fat deposition is the key because if at the end, we're going to reshape the butt using the external uh, tissues more than the internal tissues. So it's very important to check the fat deposition. Hip dips are normal. Now, we have a lot of patients asking for this hourglass, even if when they move and when they walk, they want to stay like that. But I'm always saying to them, like the hip dips are normal, but we can also uh, fill these hip dips with rather fat or with hyaluronic acid. Yes, now I'm gonna give you uh, an, uh, an example about how important the analysis of the fat deposition. So let's see this first patient with the law handles. You see that here we have these two amount of fat. Uh, law handles in the right position, not that much. And also we have this uh, out, uh, uh, the, 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 this uh, out of thighs uh, fat deposition. And if I will have to draw a line between these two amounts of fat, and then I'll need a lot of volume. And I think that the fat option was for me a better option because of why I've got to use a lot of uh, injectables. While if I will see this patient and analyze her fat, the fat handles are coming down even to the third segment of the upper butt. And uh, the outer thighs are really important. And now if, if I'll draw the line between these two, lines and then I will not have a lot of products to use and I think that with just some hyaluronic acid we can fulfill her dream and uh, 
this is a good option here for hyaluronic acids culture. Now, working in Dubai since now almost like a year and a half uh, uh, made me realize more that there is a lot of nuances between a lot different type of people. Because in the same day, we see we are seeing an Australian lady and then a Swedish, a Russian, an Emirati, a Nigerian. And the anatomy is the same, but the phenotype is different. And as plastic surgeons, we have to understand these small differences in different anatomic parts and adapt to our approach. Of course, if we will try to generalize, we will have a lot of cliches. And because when we say Asians, of course, there is Indians and there is Chinese and there is uh, uh, Thai and all of them are different, but the majority of the Asians that I see at least, they have like A shape and almost no V shaped buttocks and they have short bones with poor guttural projection. And even if you go uh, on Google or on our Twitter, you will find a lot of uh, uh, sarcasm uh, uh, from Asians themselves about their butt, talking about Asian booty disease or even ABS, Asian butt syndrome because they are doing build phase and saying, look, I have an ABS and I need some bad enhancement. They are very good candidate for hyaluronic acid if you, they don't have fat. Now, Arabs also are different. We cannot generalize, but the majority of them, they come for this heart shape. So whatever the shape of the beginning, they all want this hourglass shape and mostly they have important fat of percentage and they with with low gluteal projection and according to each region some will will have uh, inquiry about more hips and some about more gluteal uh, projection area and some will ask for both they are really good candidates for fat and also for hyaluronic acid because nowadays we are seeing a lot of them that they don't want to go under the knife and they will tell you doctor if i will have a solution without downtime and uh, if the solution only will stay one year or two years, I'm gonna take it, no, no problem. Africans and black are really gifted by God. So we have here the best scenario with the very good projection, the very nice slope from the back to the, to the buttocks with the very good skin quality at the majority of the times. They are really asking more about hip dips than the projection because they already have a good projection. And they are both candidate for fat or hyaluronic acid, while Americans, Caucasians, and some Australians, they are taller than Asians. They have long bones and they have all the shapes that may see on anatomy. And they have different skin quality also. And they ask for projection and hips enhancement, but they are not asking for big volumes like we may see here in GCC countries. And they are good candidate for both fat and hyaluronic acid as well. Now, of course, no matter the origin, the phenotype or the genotype, the anatomy is the same. So the battery reaction is the same. The fat survival is the same. The inflammation probably, or the complication may be the same. So the bone out there, the muscles are there, the fat is there and the skin is there. But we have just to distinguish a little bit by a good assessment and not go to the generalities. Of course, all the time, every case is different. But there is some common rules to observe and some methods of enhancement. So what are they? If we go, I mean, we eliminate the, 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 the post bariatric and the, the bottle lifts, we will have what? We have implants, we will have fat or combo, and we will have hyaluronic acid uh, fillers. We're only talking about hyaluronic acid fillers. Uh, uh, we will never use any other product, of course, like the safety guidelines describe it. So. What are the solutions? Acceptance and self-esteem are important. Yes, but I also need the more defined buttocks. While training and squats can help, it's important to remember that well-shaped buttocks is not only about muscles. So surgery, as we are surgeons, that is our golden tool. But you need enough and you need good fat and also very good plastic surgeon because it's blind surgery and we're going to see also that they have a very high rate of complications. Implants or combo, yes, it's a good option. We don't have bad and also we don't have projection, but sooner or later it will finish with a complication or at least the displacement or you have to go back to the OT to change these implants. 
So we will still have the hyaluronic acid, which is a very good option, especially for skinny. When I'm putting skinny like this, because uh, we'll see later that really skinny people are not the best candidate. It's safe if it's done properly. I really want to highlight this, if it's done properly. It's quick to achieve and doesn't require surgical skills. It's a permanent. I mean, if you don't like it, it's gonna go. Or also we can uh, uh, solve it. Now let's start with fat. Let's start with fat and I love to use a fat. I, I, I use fat everywhere. I use fat in my facelifts, I use fat in my lithoplasties, I use fat in, uh, in my breast segmentation, I use fat in body contouring and body sculpture because I love, I love fat, it's a fabulous tool that may help me to, to, to correct very difficult liposculpture. And of course, while doing mommy makeover, you know how you may change the whole body while with doing abdominoplasty and, 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 and breast and using fat in right proportions to change these curves. So fat for me is fabulous. And I, I really use fat everywhere because it will give me the projection that will last forever. It will also correct the, the, the hip dips. So fat is fabulous, but there is complications and we know all how many death happened due to this uh, procedure. Thanks God, nowadays we have less and less due to uh, the huge work of the four societies, I think four societies, uh, or, or, or more, let's say ICEPs and the American societies about uh, the safety guidelines uh, uh, and how to inject the fat. But still this procedure has important mortality with fat embolism, but not also. There is thromboembolism accident, hypotenia that may happen, uncontrolled blood loss, and fat necrosis, septicemia, and a lot of other complications that you know them. And this is a blind surgery that sometimes require some more experience than uh, hyaluronic acid and, and, and injection. <clears throat> so what do we have here with bioscience? <clears throat> Sorry. We have these products. I think that the majority of you already tried or may try, uh, whether Higher Corp or, or Genifel, we have two, uh, Genifel Contour and Contour Plus and two Higher Corp, MLF1 and 2. They are used in different areas, especially for products and colds. And uh, we'll see later with the injection technique uh, where and when we use them. And hyaluronic acid is fabulous because you can also achieve the same thing. I mean, you can achieve the, the, the projection, you can achieve also the pain correct, the hip dips in, in one session. And uh, of course, there is a lot of advantages. It's a quick procedure. It's like a 20 minutes procedure. It can be performed with local anesthesia and uh, like 80% without even anesthesia. It's very rewarding for both the patient and the physician. We have to admit also as physicians, this is like, uh, I mean, quick money that you may earn uh, because you will require an important number of syringes. And so it's very rewarding for the patient because also she's really happy to go directly uh, to her lunch break after and to sell a Look, I just did it and I, I'm taking my lunch with you. So it's uh, there is a strong positive psychological impact. This is what I saw uh, with my patients. The, the psychological impact is there. I mean, they see the difference when they put their gene. There is no downtime required and there is no immediate dangerous complications like the embolism we may see uh, with fat grafting. Uh, it's effective, it's immediate, it's there. It's even if you don't like it, it's, it's not for life. And also there is a possibility to redo the procedure after a few weeks if needed. So it's not for life can be an advantage, but, but also can, can be a disadvantage because sometimes people will tell you, look, I cannot afford to have like these injections several times because it's, we're not talking about a tissue that can be revascularized and like, uh, and that will stay forever with you. It may be costly if you want to do good results. I put this kind of result here. It's, uh, it's not a good result because this is what we can do with the budget we have. So uh, it's really nested also with the budget. And it's very important to, in your patient's selection to discuss about that. There is a possibility of displacement, of course, as I told you, it's, uh, there is not revascularization and we're sitting on the bat, we're moving with it, we're walking with it. 
So there is this possibility. We would let you know after uh, when we talk about the technique, how to reduce the rate of displacement. Of course, we know all these complications about inflammation, infection, nodules, hyperpigmentation, uh, system migration uh, that we saw on news even. Uh, these, I think that these complications are really nested with the indication, the technique, and the volume more than the product itself, and that's why that's why here I'm I, I'm here to speak also about bioscience because now after a couple of years I'm uh, I trust the product. Now, no matter the origin, the phenotype, or the genotype, I think that in my experience, uh, the best shape will be the a the heart shape. And the worst scenario will be this V and square shape because they are really difficult to fix only with hyaluronic acid. They are even difficult to, to fix with, the, with fat, you know that. Uh, also, uh, the, the best uh, volume will be mild volume. Uh, of course, big volumes that they want bigger, they are, it's not good. And also, the very skinny patient, they are really not a good candidate because you will have you'll see your product uh, quickly and you will have more displacement and also you may have more inflammation because you are very close to the skin. And uh, skin laxity is one of the most important thing here to consider. Uh, good skin laxity is, is really important. When you have someone after massive weight loss, it's not really a good candidate. And uh, uh, you may uh, change the indication to a body lift or to a combo. Now, the good and bad indications, talk about the patients, now the indications. As I said, the, the bad indications after massive weight loss, I did some cases uh, uh, that uh, really wanted some areas. But it's really complicated to, to achieve that how many a nice slope and nice curve. And you're gonna quickly go in very big number of syringes and then to danger zones. So I would not advise to go uh, with massive weight loss of patients uh, with hyaluronic acid. Uh, significant skin looseness, of course, uh, or sub, uh, potential fat overload. Also, these are not good candidate. If they want to just correct so cellulitis, these are not very a good candidate. The athletic or skinny, we spoke about it, and the pronos, it, it ptosis of the buttocks, this is not lifting, uh, lifting product. It's, it may give you a lifting effect. It's like for the face, the people say that this uh, uh, hyaluronic acid will lift you the mid face. Hyaluronic acid is not, it cannot lift, but it will give you a lifting effect, but the push-up effect of the tissues but sooner or later, we live on Earth, and there is gravity, and things will go down. So the high expectations paired with a limited budget. Also, when the patient will come with the V-shape, and there is no projection at all, and, and very important uh, fibrosis tissue, especially after surgery, and they will tell you, look, and they will show you a photo. I want the same, and I have the money for it. It's not about money. It's, it's about uh, what we can do and what we cannot do. And also the people that uh, the same night will go to party, we have a lot of them in Dubai, they go directly and they even take a photo and send it from the beach. They are turning directly after. So now you will see that I'm putting, uh, I'm putting now uh, some uh, dressing just to remind the patient that, uh, that we did something also. The good candidate are uh, the moderate BMI with limited fat available for surgical consideration. These are really good candidates. They know exactly what they want and they they, they, they are really, uh, I mean, they know all the complications. They know that they, they don't want to go to the surgery and uh, maybe one day. So these are really good candidates. Uh, the good candidate for fat grafting, but also not really for the surgery. They, they, they may tell you, look, I just want to have this. Let's start, for example, with the hip dips. And uh, if it's working, believe me, they will come back for the projection also. And these are really also good candidates. And the ones that uh, doing some workout and they want to enhance like just the top uh, of the buttocks or the, 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 the slope between the back, the lower back and, and the upper part of the buttocks, uh, these are also good, uh, good candidates. The moderate enhancement aimed at improving curves. This is, I mean, when you have a, a, a patient that knows exactly what uh, hyaluronic acid uh, injection mean, the quantity 
that we are using and how to do a follow-up and probably she will come back for a vision. These are the, are very good candidates. So can we talk about fight between hyaluronic acid and fat? As a surgeon, I'm, I'm gonna tell you that like for the face, body fillers can never replace surgery. When there is an indication for facelift, you cannot overfill the patient and have this botched uh, effect will overfill the patient. This is the same. When you have an indication for a butt lift after losing a lot of weight, it's the indication for surgery. You, have, you only want a big amount of fat. Of course, you cannot play with the C-ridges and put like hundreds and hundreds. No, of course. And for like the face, there is good and bad indications for the fillers. Exactly. And they should never fight. They even may cooperate after sometimes your rhinoplasty. You still have like a little bit of irregularities on your dose. And the patient is not really, I mean, uh, ready to go again for revision. You are not really ready for the go again for revision. And with a small drop of hyaluronic acid, is done, is done for one year and she will come back after one year and you do like small drops after a couple of years, you'll do nothing because the fibrosis is there. It's exactly the same. Sometimes I use it even after my BBL and sometimes I have like the small uh, uh, problem in the hip dip because now they really want this have to have this curve even when they walk and they take uh, different photos. And uh, when you, they are ready to, to, to have this perfect photo. So of course, uh, we can discuss, and if it's a, a good indication, why not? We can put hyaluronic acid after the, the surgery. So they should never fight. There is an indication in the population for both, and sometimes the population can consume that, it can consume hyaluronic acid. If I personally prefer putting hyaluronic acid for lips enhancement in an adequate way and a reasonable quantity rather than fats, I don't put a lot of fat in my lips during uh, and the lips, I, I not mine. <laughs> the lips, I'm I'm operating. I prefer doing hyaluronic acid. Uh, so I also prefer to put hyaluronic acid in light way, a reasonable quantity to treat a small head dip or to add a little pro projection. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, we're gonna talk later about the complication. And similar to facial fillers, body fillers can also lead to complications. For the face, these include necrosis, amputation, blindness, overfilling and heaviness, tendon effect and distortion, and you know all the complications about the face. So the only reason for continuing facial injection is our extensive knowledge <clears throat> about the dangerous zones and the technique and the indication based on viscosity and reality. And I believe that, of course, we don't sleep uh, on our faces and we don't walk with our faces, but this underscores the need to invest more on science uh, to an education rather than to reject completely uh, body fillers. Thank you very much. Oops, unmute me. Thank you so much, Dr. Cardi. This was, um, I think, really important. Um, this was an excellent presentation to show the pros and cons um, of, of each procedure. And um, personally, I agree 100% with you that both things are complementary and shouldn't be um, posed as, as opposition to each other. So um, I'm, I'm pretty sure that um, that's also the opinion probably of Dr. Schlaudraff, that um, HA fillers are not, not an opponent or a replacement um, for classical lipofilling in, in all indications that um, we're speaking about, not only the uh, buttocks, but also the face, but, but can add complementary to this. So... Um, as we're a little bit behind the time, I would take the liberty to um, keep on going with my partner about um, understanding the gluteal anatomy, and um, then we summarize um, and even discuss um, after we finished our talks if this is okay for you. So my part is um, going to be about um, the anatomy of the gluteal region, and um, I think we're going to pick up a couple of um, ideas and themes that already have been introduced by Dr. Schlaudraff when he spoke about um, safety concerns when it comes to those um, interventions. And then obviously also from Dr. Cotti when he spoke about choosing the right patient. Because if you think about it, what ultimately makes up the shape of your buttock is the underlying anatomy. And that's not only the underlying anatomy of the fat or the muscle or the bone or the skin, but all of it together. Now, whenever we want to change something, we need to be aware which components of something we can actually modulate, okay? So um, when it comes to facelift surgery, obviously we have to work on the fat, on the ligaments, on the skin. 
if we're not maxillofacial surgeons, we can't work on the bone. And um, this kind of limits also when we speak about shaping the buttock, our options, because we actually can only change the skin of the buttocks and the fat of the buttocks. We can't really work on the muscle. Um, we have been given a plethora of reasons that I will pick up later on as well, especially due to safety concerns, but we shouldn't change the muscle by injecting any substances there. And obviously we can't change the bone. We're not uh, orthopedic or trauma surgeons who do pelvic surgery. And I think, um, especially for aesthetic concerns, that this should never be an option. So we have to look at the skin and we have to look at the fat. And um, we need to understand that this interplay of fat kind of covering the muscle and the bone really defines our different shapes. And now uh, we've been over this with Dr. Cotti, so I'm uh, kind of uh, summarizing this again. You need to be aware that there are different shapes of the buttock. And um, those shapes are defined by the configuration of three points. And you find those three points in every of your patients. Actually, for me, that's an algorithm I follow with every patient, either for lipo filling or injection of HA. How does it look like? We define our point, the upper lateral hip, that's point A. And then we define point B, which is the most protruding point at the lateral leg below the buttock. And then we obviously have our mid buttock area, which is the point of the highest protrusion or highest depression. And then following those ideas of point A, B, C, you get either an A shape. A shape is defined by a being the smallest point, followed by C, followed by B. There are three patient examples of what an A shape looks like. Then we do have a V shape, which is, as Dr. Cotti said, also the hardest to treat for obvious reasons, um, because you're lacking most of the volume to get it to a round shape, which we will see later on. So you can see that point A is the biggest, C smaller, and B the smallest. So you get this V, this descent. And then we have the squared buttocks. Squared buttocks are buttocks where you have the lower leg, the mid buttock projection, and the upper buttock projection in one line. So it looks like a rack. And then obviously the most favorable shape of a buttock is obviously the round buttock shape. Um, that's when A and B are in line and you have point C projecting outwards. This gives you this um, cheeky buttock look many patients are asking for. And um, actually those shapes have been classified first by Dr. Mendieta from Miami. And um, he wrote an excellent paper about the classifications of different buttocks. And um, they were actually written for lipofilling, for BBLs. But I think that we have to kind of adhere and follow the same rules and ideas when it comes to injecting the, the HA into our patients. Now, we need to be aware that our liberty of changing sacral height to gluteal crease length is obviously very, very limited when it comes to fillers. We can optically work a little bit on this when we do lipofilling, but for fillers, and I'm curious about your opinions, Dr. Kotti and Schlaudraff, it's really hard to change this sacral height to gluteal crease length. However, you need to be aware that they are kind of differentiating. And then we need to assess the volume. We need to assess the volume of our buttock anatomy. And there are four quadrants, quadrant one, two, three, and four. And you need to be aware that the projection and the amount of subcutaneous fat you find in each quadrant is different. It's not one homogeneous layer that kind of covers your buttocks, but it is highest in the quadrant number one and smallest in quadrant number four. So you will see that already here, the superficial and deep fatty layer of your subcutaneous fat is differing a lot just within this small circle that I've drawn here. And we will dwell on this later on why it becomes important when we inject and when we want to inject it safe. Then obviously, if you look at the anatomy from a lateral point, you also need to be aware that there are different zones. We have our upper, central, and lower buttock zones. And um, this is kind of the lateral view of the buttock that you also need to take into consideration. So when we look at the anatomy, it's not only the anatomy from posterior, but also the anatomy from lateral that needs to be taken into consideration. Now, something we're hearing and actually doing more and more is not only beautification of the buttocks, but rejuvenation of the buttocks. The amount of patients which are now beyond their 40s, 45s, and 50s looking for buttock augmentation is increasing every year. So BBL has traditionally been a procedure for rather younger patients, but our patients are becoming older and older. So we also need to be aware of how the anatomy is actually changing when um, we get older. And um, I kind of took this image of a, of a ripe, young, fresh peach, and then a little bit older peach. So you can see that there are some changes and we have the same in the buttocks and they're actually really nice studies 
performed by um, scientists who broke down the bone remodeling of the pelvis in three phases. You don't really need to kind of remember them, but just be aware that the bone is changing a lot as we get older. And you can see this quite nicely in the CT scans from this publication it's quoted down here that you can use. You can see that the pelvis is becoming smaller and smaller. And also the coccygeal um, protrusion right here is kind of folding inwards more and more as we get older. So already here, you can see that as our bone is changing, as we get older, we are also losing projection in our buttocks, which is quite interesting. And this is a limitation we need to make our patients aware of because we can't really change this bony framework. We can just camouflage those changes. Now, um, speaking about the overall um, look of the young and the old buttock, um, we're always speaking about a saggy buttock in males and in females as we get older. And there's this really fascinating um, pop, um, uh, publication by Babuko um, done in 2002, which is quite um, some time ago, more than 20 years. And he did those anthropometric measurements. And he found out that in males, literally really the only significant difference between a young and an old buttock is this beeline between the um, uh, tuberance um, protrusion right here. And you can see that this is significantly greater with increasing age, but the rest remains more or less the same. Now in females, it's kind of also the same idea that this B to B line gets bigger and bigger as we get older. However, A, which is the um, iliac crest and C, which is drawn at the line of the intra um, gluteal crease more or less stay the same. So what happens is that we get this, let's call it expansion at point B, A and C stay more or less the same, get a little bit wider. And then you often have this deficiency right here. So hip tips are not only found in young patients, obviously, but also in elderly patients. Why? Because there is this expansion of point B to B, but A and C are not moving or expanding in the same ratio. So something to be considered. Now, if we look at it from the lateral view, you can see that in the male buttock, there's not really much changing, okay? They have those different angles and lines, alpha line, beta line, they measured this in young and old buttocks, not really significant change. But if we look at females, we can see that the alpha line and beta line are getting greater and bigger as women get older. So the authors concluded that males had less ptosis of the buttock with less reduction of the gluteal volume as they age than females, which is an important information because um, personally, I also treat males um, with um, uh, with HA in the buttock region, and uh, many males are really happy with this, but you need to make them aware that it's not so much volume loss in ptosis as they get older as they find in their female counterparts. Now, moving a little bit away from this idea of pure aging, we also need to speak about the changes of fat as we get older. We have two different fat layers, a superficial and a deep fatty layer, which is kind of covered by a deep fascia on top of the muscle and then separated by a superficial fascia. And um, this is an early publication of uh, our research team published in PRS 2019. And um, we could actually show that as we get older, the superficial fatty layer becomes thinner and the deep fatty layer becomes bigger. And obviously, as we increase with BMI, overall thickness becomes bigger. But and this is really important with increasing BMI, the superficial fatty layer becomes bigger as well. So be aware in skinny patients, you have a very thin superficial fatty layer and a bigger deep fatty layer. And elderly ones, it changes. And as they get bigger, have a higher BMI, the superficial fatty layer becomes bigger and bigger. Why does it matter? Because the superficial and deep fatty layer is differently arranged. We'll speak about this later on and can be a good guidance in which layer you are actually moving your cannula. Now, spanning on top of the muscle is something called superficial facial system. You will find this basically everywhere in the body. Ted Lockwood was um, the first to introduce this idea of the superficial facial system, 1991 in PRS. And this is a CT scan um, he published in this, um, in this article. And you can see right here that the superficial and deep fat is kind of lobulated and engulfed by something we call the superficial facial system. The superficial facial system is not only found in the buttocks, it's found on the arms, in your abdomen, and even in your face, because we always have a deep fascia and a superficial fascia. The superficial fascia, for example, of the mid face is the superficial musculoponeurotic system. It's continuous with the superficial temporal fascia in the forehead and the platysma in the lower face. You can see that this idea of a superficial and a deep fascia and fat in between kind of is consecutive through the entire body. Now, here you can see that those 
um, facial system fibers are not only in a horizontal way. It's often shown in many publications just like as a horizontal arrangement, but that's not true. It's rather really intertwining. So moving from the super deep to the superficial fascia into the skin, and it's more like a honeycomb web. And this honeycomb web becomes really important because the fat lobules found in the superficial fatty layer are much, much smaller than the lobules in the deep fatty layer. So be aware that obviously there's going to be more resistance in the superficial fatty layer. Why? Because you have more collagenous strands creating the superficial facial system and separating those small fatty lobules. So when you're superficial, you are feeling more resistance. In the face, for example, we often differentiate between superficial and deep by either feeling the bone if we're superperiosteally or by lifting the cannula and being able to see it. And then we have ideas like if you lift it and can see the movement, but not the cannula, you're deeper. If you lift it and can actually see the contours of the cannula, you're superficial. This doesn't really work in the buttocks because we have much, much more fat. So we have to rely on another measurement. And Dr. Cotti said so beautifully, we're blind once we go down with the cannula and don't use an ultrasound. So um, the superficial fatty layer has more resistance and you can use this as a certain guidance when you inject. Now, um, right here, you can again see in a, in a cut we did um, in, a, in a cadaver and then obviously also in an ultrasound that it's always this pattern of skin, superficial fat, superficial fascia, deep fat, deep fascia. And again, you can see deep fat is much bigger lobulated than the superficial one. Now, we're speaking a lot about ligaments in the face, orbicular cutaneous ligaments, zygomatic cutaneous ligament, McGregor's patch, mandibular ligament, all those ligaments. We do have them in the buttock as well. We do have ligamentous adhesions down there that we need to respect. And Gavami um, did this beautiful publication in, um, I think it was 2018, 19, um, something around there, where he showed those um, tenderness adhesions in the buttock region. And most cranially, we do have the sacrocutaneous ligament. Then in the intragluteal cleft, we have the gluteal cleft adhesion. We have an issue cutaneous ligament ranging really down from the ischial tuberosity into the skin. And we have a gluteal crease adhesion. So you need to be aware of those um, different ligamentous adhesions because they also provide a certain limitation for you. And you will feel more resistance if you move over them. Those of you who perform liposuction um, do know this, that there are certain bound regions where we have um, or require more force to actually get through this. And this is obviously the same in the buttock region as it is bordered by ligaments. Now, one of the important um, safety concerns that were raised in the last hour was obviously um, an intravenous injection of um, uh, both fat and filler. And we need to be aware that it's not so much the arteries we're afraid of in the face, we're rather afraid of intra-arterial injections in the buttock, it's rather um, injecting into the veins. So we need to be aware that in all layers, we will find veins. There's no avascular plane. I hate this term avascular plane. Um, there is no such thing as an avascular plane. If you have an avascular plane, then um, something occurs, which is called necrosis. So in all the layers, we will find vessels. It's just about the size of the vessels. And um, you can see that in the subcutaneous tissue, regardless of superficial or deep fatty layer, the diameter of the veins is one millimeter, round about on average. In the gluteus maximus muscle, it's already 1.3 millimeters. And below this, in the submuscular space, we have an infra, uh, inferior gluteal vein with a diameter of 13 millimeters on average, a superior gluteal vein of seven millimeters, and then so on. They get a little bit smaller, but you need to be aware that those are big vessels. And what is really important is that um, in this uh, study performed by Ordinana and published in um, ASJ 2020, they did this investigation in a cadaver. Now we need to be aware that even if we fill the vessels with latex in a dead body, they will never have the same size as in the real body. Why? Because they're lacking systemic pressure, even if the venous systemic pressure isn't really high. But you need to be aware of this, that this is always underestimating the actual size. So be aware that there are big vessels below your muscle. Um, you can see right here also schematically where you find the superior and the inferior gluteal vein in relation um, to the tuberal and um, tuberosity and also to the iliac spine. And you have to be aware that it's not only the big vessel you're afraid of, but also the tributaries. Now, in terms of arterial supply, we also need to be aware of this, even though I told you that an intra-arterial injection is not so much of an issue when we are superficial. Why is it not an issue? Because we have so many concomitant arteries. Um, this region is well supplied by lumbar artery, deep circumflex iliac artery, the lateral sacral artery, 
artery, superior inferior gluteal artery, internal pudendal artery, lateral circumflex femoral artery, and the profound femoral artery. So you can be quite sure that there's another um, angiosome taking over when you cut off an artery by injecting HA into this, but still should be aware of the wide distribution of vessels down there. Now, um, we will go over a little bit to the rheology that we need uh, to know about and need to fill in before I will hand over to the um, injection technique parts by Dr. Cotti. Um, there are two fillers that I use mainly in practice. Um, I decided to use MLF1 and MLF2 for me, not because I think that Jennifer is an inferior product or MLF2 or MLF1 is superior, um, just because I started working with it, liked it so much. And I always feel like staying with one product once you've made your mind up um, is, is kind of a way to erase one potential um, um, issue, um, one error source. Um, so I'm mainly using MLF1, MLF2. The main difference in the rheology, um, let's put it that way, between MLF1 and MLF2 is that MLF1 has a slightly higher G prime. Both of them are giving you a good um, lifting. Um, but the particle size in MLF1 um, is a little bit um, smaller than an MLF2. So it is kind of um, uh, less, uh, let's say a little bit more light. Um, you can work a little bit more superficial. If you want to have a real nice projection, um, then um, you can use MLF2. Regardless of that, if you have a patient on a budget, um, you can always work your way around with both products and won't have an issue. That's um, what I like about them. If you have a patient who's just um, wanting to have a small touch-up, um, then you don't have to, to sacrifice um, any, any properties with uh, one or the other products. As I said, the only difference that you have is um, the particle size, MLF2 300 to 500 um, micrometers and MLF1 200 to 350. They come in 10 ml syringes. Um, Indication-wise, they are differing a little bit from each other. Um, MLF2 is indicated for buttocks, um, MLF1 for hands, buttocks, calves, and overall concavity. So if you want to be super um, strict and stay completely on label, which I think sometimes becomes an issue now with new MDR to stay strictly on label, um, then you have to use MLF1. Also, sometimes MLF1 works beautifully if you have a patient after liposuction who has a little concavity somewhere where he's not happy about you can perfectly um, use mlf1 to to make this more regular especially in the beginning and um, if you don't want to do um, fat grafting because it's such a small deficiency so um, those are the two products in terms of rheology i always like to see the product for a couple of times when i start using a product when i actually inject it with um, ultrasound and uh, for this reason, we did a little, um, uh, let's say, not study. It was an internal observation of how the different fitters um, work best. And I'm really curious about um, Dr. Cotti, who's going to tell us how he's um, injecting, which techniques he's using. As I found out that for me, serial puncture technique with a cannula for MLF2 works best if I want to get the highest projection. Um, you can see right here that if I inject the filler, it starts to give a really nice sphere. And this really nice sphere can be kind of created up to 1.5 cc, which is quite a lot. And then after 1.5 c, we'll see this later on once I turn this now here, you can see that it starts to expand laterally. And lateral expansion means that you do not get the same lifting effect um, or projection effect as you get um, when it's stair spherical. So for me, um, most of the times what I use is the serial injection bolus technique. So I give a bolus, little thread while retract, give the next bolus, little thread wide retract and then the next bolo. So this is basically um, how I then try to combine um, this idea of anatomy of patient selection and rheology to give my patient a good result. So without further ado, I'm uh, handing back over to Dr. Cotti, um, who will now give us um, a little overview um, about the ejection techniques he uses to augment buttocks using HA fillers. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frank. Um, so, um, could you give me the the presentation, please? Could you switch to the second presentation, Bioscience? We're going to talk about the injections techniques, and uh, Dr. Frank talk about uh, uh, MLF1 and MLF2. I'm wearing uh, Jellyfell, 
So uh, we choose our flags, <laughs> but we'll not fight. <laughs> we'll not fight, no worries. Uh, and I think that for bioscience, uh, whether you go for the higher corp or the, with Jennifer, they, they are fine. So um, we talk about injection techniques and um, we just have to remind everyone that this hyaluronic acid characteristic, you just talk about it, uh, are totally different from the hyaluronic acid we use uh, in the face. And also the technique should be defined to avoid fast resorption and, uh, and side effects. And that's why the high molecular weight down of the layers of for body uh, treatments, uh, that's why they are different from face uh, treatments. We have particle size are bigger and we have high core body or Jennifer contour, both of them they may provide bigger particles because smaller particles expose more surface and less volume. So they have faster resorption while larger particles are much more stable against uh, enzymatic degradation and larger particles are more also resistant uh, to, to their volumes. What we learned from the face injections, the higher G prime is, the deeper you have to go with the injection. So when you use high G prime products in the face injection, you have to go directly into the bone. And this will give like an implant effect with more firmness and they will stay more, which is not, I mean, if you take a high G prime and you put it just close to the skin or for example, mesolabial fold, what you will have, you will have granuloma and you will have a lot of inflammation all around. This is not good. So high G prime products have to be really deep so at least you will not have a lot of inflammation and a lot of granulomas and this is what we aim to do here in but uh, the buttocks region we have higher corp and we have genifel again you choose your flag but both of them are tried both and i use more genifel than than higher corp for the only reason i find like genifel very very nice, very smooth, and give me like uh, sweet results. So I keep Jennifer, but of course, Higher Corp is a wonderful product also. Both of them are uh, with 10 ml syringes and they may stay up to 24 months. I usually tell my patients it's between one year and two years. They are biphasic, they may stay more, and uh, it's much better to uh, use 18 uh, coach cannula. Uh, so the product will go uh, fluidly, directly, where exactly you want it to. So before you start, we talk about the patient selection. It's very important also to, 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 to think about the patient selection and understand the patient's wishes and the budget limitation. Why I'm talking about the budget? Because I have no problem to talk about it. It's very important when the patient will have this small amount of budget and want big expectation, you have to tell her that it's not possible. And before you start, you have to sign a consent form that includes all the potential side effects, as well as a photo shooting and sharing agreement. Then mark your landmarks and target areas and show them to the patient, where while she's standing in front of the mirror with a permanent marker, why permanent marker? Because if, if you do like chloroxidine or betadine, this probably will disappear. So permanent marker is, is good because you're gonna switch position. Now analyze your target and focus on trophicity and elasticity. And this, the pinch test you're gonna do, uh, the, your experience will tell you more about the skin elasticity and it's very important. So then you exactly you know which product you're gonna use and how deep you're gonna be. And then mark your entry point according to your technique. I will not guide you for one technique. You, if you're right-handed, you have to be comfortable. If you're left-handed, you have to be comfortable. You know your danger zones and you can, go wherever you want. Clean and sterilize the area after idly removing the patient's underwear and providing no reusable disposable ones. Of course, if the patient sometimes she refuses to completely remove the underwear, so it's much better to really hide it and clean uh, everything with betadine. Now inject lidocaine with adrenaline superficially with a G30 uh, needle. And uh, why superficially, I really want to do this small bomb at the, uh, exactly uh, in the entry point. So at least uh, later, even if with my 18 gauge, uh, uh, I'll not see any blood coming. I, I see this small bomb and I know exactly where to put my cannula. And depending on the patient's tolerance, use diluted local anesthesia as required. So what I do in my practice is I, I, I prepare the solution and 500 ml saline water or sometimes even to uh, 250. I put lidocaine 20 ml, one milligram of adrenaline and uh, naropaine 
not always uh, bicarbonate, and I don't I didn't see any difference, honestly. But I don't use it all the time. It means that uh, I, I start always to uh, directly after the general, the small anesthesia I'm doing for the entry point. Directly, I start with the, with the injection. I don't do anesthesia for the face exactly. I don't do anesthesia also for the buttocks. If you're in the right place, if you're not that deep into the to the muscle, it's, you're not very superficial. It will not uh, hurt the patient. But depending on the patient, sometimes I will opt for this uh, uh, anesthesia, and then I will penetrate the anesthesia, and I will tell the patient that probably this result will decrease a little bit after two days. And of course, ensure to work under sterile conditions all the time. It's very important. Now, uh, Dr. Frank talked about his technique, uh, especially about the serial puncture, which is a very important uh, and good uh, technique that you have also to master about the quantity you're given all the time. The bolus, it has to be uh, not that big. And, 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 and step by step, you do it. And it's a very nice technique, uh, uh, like the linear threads also, or the funnel technique. I use a mix between the funnel technique and the serial puncture. And this is what I'm showing here. So the injecting technique for me, the best way is to have like 45 degrees uh, and to target the deep adipose tissue. So of course you can also put uh, superficially, but I really like to put it under the fascia and uh, it's 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 safer and i do this retrograde injection with the small boluses but i it's it's quick you're gonna see it on the video it's really quick for the hip dips i inject posteriorly and then i inject anteriorly because we're talking about uh, almost like 200 degrees here and we have to satisfy the patient when she see herself in the mirror but also satisfy the patient when she wear her jeans so the tips and tricks I'm, I'm gonna share with you that the guidelines is to never exceed the 150 cc uh, during a, a session. But let me tell you, it's like for the, when, when you place your nipple or your like complex, when you treat a photic breast, you do, you're not place it all the time in 18 centimeter or 16 or 20 centimeter because a tall lady is not is not is not a short lady, and the four centimeters in the breast are not the four centimeters uh, Filipino lady or Swedish lady. Exactly the same when you have the big amount of fat onto the buttock. It's not like a skinny patient. So the one fifty unit injected into a small buttocks are not equivalent exactly to the one fifty unit in a larger buttocks. But you have to understand your limits, and this will come a little bit with experience. But for now, I think it's much better to stay with the 150 that bioscience, uh, according to the statistics. Uh, I think that you correct me later, there is no uh, scientific study, uh, I mean, proof about this amount that we cannot exceed because in my practice, I sometimes exceed this amount. Avoid injection in dangerous zones. It's very important, such as close the anus or lower part of the buttocks. So these, this part, we gonna sit on it and uh, the displacement and also due to this uh, ligaments uh, that the Dr. Frank show uh, with the Dr. Gavami uh, paper uh, are also very important to consider. So these are some dangerous zones that we have to uh, avoid. And also avoid seeing your cannula because if you're seeing your cannula move in your skin, it's your, you're, you're a little bit too superficial. And this is, I think in my practice, something that we have to avoid. I'm sorry. Of course, I do not advise to go deep and inject the muscle. First, it's painful, then it's risky, and uh, you don't have to go that deep, and then you will not see the, 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 the effect. You have to see the effect of expansion that you're providing with your injection also. So no uh, uh, injection into the muscle. And gently pinch the injected area between your fingers. So you're gonna see what I'm I'm gonna do here. I'm just taking the the the, the skin uh, from it's like a life section. So taking the skin here and I, I inject from the from the other side uh, with the with the with the right hand, like you you're seeing here. So at least I know that I'm 45 degrees. I know I feel the fascia and I'll go under the fascia and then I inject gently. And perform injections first in the prone position, then in standing position. Uh, of course, uh, this is especially for uh, the hip dips. 
Now, what the patient has to avoid is anticoagulant and anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, uh, like two days, I'm, I'm not telling them uh, seven, seven days, uh, and avoid, of course, waxing or bleaching or hair removal. We have a lot of patients that come directly and want to inject, so we ask if they already did that, uh, otherwise we, we go ahead. Now I keep this kind of taping. Uh, the major reason really is to tell them that you did something and you have to be uh, uh, at least for 24 or 48 hours without partying, without uh, dancing, without clubbing, without tanning, and without sex also uh, for these 48 hours and try to sleep a prone position. I never gave antibiotic, never. Uh, I only give the uh, painkillers uh, or sometimes anti-inflammatory uh, pills, that's it. You have to see the patient and you have to follow her. So during this three weeks or three, four weeks, it's much better to avoid sun if we already have a small echemosis because this probably will be like late hyperpigmentation that we want to avoid, especially with dark skins. If the patient can remain in prone position during the night, otherwise it's okay. It's no problem after after one week if she cannot control herself and avoid workout only for the first two weeks. I tell the patient, go ahead, even with squats after after two weeks. What I notice that, uh, and, and the complications sometimes I receive, and I also once have an inflammation, it was just after a plane during the initial weeks. And I think it's uh, we can discuss it later. If, did you observe uh, for my colleagues any concerns about this? Uh, probably this biofilm and the and the pressure with the with the airplane. Do we have this kind of relationship that may cause a little bit of inflammation? Uh, we it's uh, I really want to discuss this with you, and then schedule a follow up appointment with the patient after two weeks to make necessary adjustment. You may add some fillers after is it's really important to see we injected this side and also this side to give her a nice this patient with the effect of the head I was gentle with you perfect perfect is the word amazing didn't feel nothing thank you very much and uh, she's so sweet and she was really uh sweet to send us uh, also uh, uh sorry to send us her uh, her video, <laughs> we cannot see. <laughs> okay, we'll see. Yes, her video after after three weeks. She's doing a lot of workouts. She's a coach, uh, uh, and this is her work. And this is her after after three weeks. This is ideally what we have to do. Uh, what we have to have with uh, with body uh, colors. Now I'll finish with the last slide. Uh, about the techniques for the for the calves, the for the calves, uh, uh, I don't do any bolus injections. I really go quickly uh, and quickly, as you are seeing, and uh, I am just here. There is also no anesthesia, and uh, of course, uh, never be really deep to be on the muscle, uh, uh, under the muscle, or in the muscle. But you have to be a little bit deep. To be just under the, the pressure. Thank you very much. And I give you the mic, Mr. Dr. Frank. Thank you, Dr. Cotty. This was um, beautiful. Um, I agree with you definitely for calves region, um, no bonus injections. Um, but this kind of links back, I think, to the overall idea how much matrix you have. Um, and I think this is something really important when we think about all the different techniques that you present to us. Just like with fat grafting, we need to be aware that there's a certain limitation of space um, that is that is given in any area. And you can't overfill. You have a certain matrix that you can fill. And um, this is probably something for beginners with HA fillers, um, which needs to be um, kind of, they need to be made aware of is that I think the HA is less forgiving when you deposit too much volume in one region than, for example, fat. Um, what is your take on this, Dr. Cotty? You said that uh, you, you can put more fat in the same region than we are. No, I said fat is more forgiving than HA oh, when you yes. deposit in, in the wrong region. This is something that probably needs to be be said to people who performed lipofilling for a long time and then transitioned to doing HA for some body indications. Look, look, we are surgeons and we have to be precise uh, all the times. And I think that the learning curve, uh, we don't... Uh, 
we need to have like a perfect target to achieve like uh, with the hyaluronic acid it's much better especially if we start to to to, to target some areas and step by step you're going to learn the product uh, more and more and you're going to see the, the the transformation that you're doing with your injection directly the expansion you're doing you're going to uh, see exactly what MLF1 or MLF2 what uh, Jennifer uh, can do contour and contour plus and step by step you may achieve you may play with these tools to achieve what you want I think it's like for lipofilling. Uh, it, we never get this perfect result at the beginning when you start to do lipofilling, and step by step we understand more the technique, and we understand more when we can have to be aggressive and where to put the fat to have more stability. Uh, the time it's exactly the same. There is a learning curve. Uh, the only thing is that it, it's it's tricky to uh, when I go to, uh, to 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 some workshops. And I see the doctors taking the canalas, all of them are superficial. I mean, all of them, they start and they are really superficial. And probably this is for me one of the reasons we do have a lot of uh, inflammation after these uh, th these injections. It's really important when I when I inject that at a certain point, I'm not seeing the skin moving with my cannula because I'm not, uh, there is no uh, ligament or uh, connective tissue between the skin that uh, and and the fascia that I'm hurting because I already I'm under the fascia and for me this is uh, the best and safest way to have less uh, complications and to maximize the effect but I understand that it's not easy to go directly that deep uh, since the beginning it will require more learning curve. So again, uh, getting uh, superficial, I think it's getting more complication. That, I mean, that's superficial. One, one, I, I think it's hard to generalize it in that way because I think with the right indication, the right product, you can also be a little bit more superficial. But I think then the question comes back to this overall idea we have, what is superficial, what is really deep? And then there's actually only, I think, the 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 ultrasound that can help us to verify so um when i started doing body contouring fitters um i always took the ultrasound probe from uh, with me not for the entire injection but just to see once where's my cannula where do i move and then verify um the point i was getting to um with forgiving is um i think something we should still shortly discuss i'm happily cutting back on the complication management but there's something i think um i'd also like to hear the opinion of dr staudraff there's a recent publication by a U.S. group in ASJ uh, proposing the SEMA technique um, for lipofilling in the buttock region. So it's basically static injection, migration, and um, equilibration. What they do is they use ultrasound um, to control the injection of their fat, inject the bolus, then let it migrate, and then use the cannula without filling it to kind of distribute it over the buttocks. Um, I don't Think that this will ever work with hyaluronic acid fitter injections we had a vivid discussion about this um this was a little bit where i wanted to get to when i said it's less forgiving than fat what's what's your take on this when we compare ha versus fat dr schlaudraff i think there's two factors one factor to being fat being more forgiving is obviously that if you overfill the matrix you will have more resorption so ultimately yeah. some of the effect goes away by itself in contrast if you do the same a, an injection that is too superficial or too big of a bolus, you will have some palpability and you might have to go back and do some hyaluronidase in order to, to uh, dissolve it. Or with this product that uh, bioscience, the, some, some massaging actually really does the trick in the most of the cases because there is no capsular formation. And with that, you can kind of even it out. On the other hand, um, the principle of lipo shifting in itself is forever old that is uh, has nothing to do with the idea of uh, power assisted in the or uh, vibration in the proper in the proper sense um and i do agree with you i don't think it's going to ever work with hyaluronic acid because the rheology is very different so will you will not have the same effect all you might do is actually shift the fat into into uh, the hyaluronic acid deposits and then the other way around thank you 
All right, then um, for the sake of time, I will um, quickly go over complication management. Um, it needs to be said, and this is really important at this point, that there is no um, validated guideline. Um, I kind of summarized um, the complication management we, we do. Um, and um, But it needs to be said that this is not a S3 guideline, and we're still lacking this when it comes to body contouring um, injections. Um, I think the plethora of complications that can be observed are skin discoloration, swelling, nodules, infections, vascular, we will dwell on this later on a little bit, um, but those are the five main groups. And then obviously I think um, we need to break this down. Skin discoloration, what can we actually observe? It's either hematoma, which develops within minutes to hours. It's ischemia, can occur very rarely, but can occur if it occurs, it's also within minutes to hours. And then we sometimes can observe neovascularization within days to weeks, as well as hyperpigmentation days to weeks. So already by looking at the time frame, you can break it down to um, what, what is actually going on when a patient reports about skin discoloration. Um, obviously, the most common case of skin discoloration you will observe when you do body contouring is hematoma. Um, this is part of, of every informed consent. Um, I make my patients really aware of that even with a minimally invasive treatment like injection of, of HA fillers, hematoma can occur. Obviously, it's not the same hematoma bruising that you do have when you do lipofilling. Um, but every patient should be aware of this. Also ask for them if they plan to go on a vacation um, the next week. Many patients don't think about this when they come to their office or to your office, um, thinking they can get a final touch before they're off to their, their honeymoon vacation, Bora Bora, where they wear a bikini all day. Make them aware that hematoma can be a possible complication. Obviously, management is compression. If I see some uh, bruising already when I insert the cannula, sometimes it bleeds a little bit more, sometimes it bleeds a little bit less, just compress. And if I have the feeling um, that uh, there might be a little bit more bruising due to fibrotic soft tissue that I'm going through, um, because I needed to do a little bit more subcision than I would usually do with my cannula, um, I give them a heparin or vitamin K um, topical agent in Spain. It's uh, thrombocyte forte. Um, there are identical um, topical agents, I think, in, in all countries. If the hemoziderin persists, and um, we had a patient we didn't inject, but um, that was injected by, by another doctor, um, who came to us for um, the persistent um, um, presence of hemosiderin, you can use lasers. Um, we have a dermatologist in-house who, who takes care of this. Um, same uh, can be applied to neovascularization. Sometimes there is um, a presence of neovascularization, very rare, but there are cases prescribed. I've never seen it um, in real life, but there are some literature reports about this. In general, the consent is to wait for 12 months or up to 12 months. If there's a lack of improvement, you can use either laser or IPL in those as well. Now, hyperpigmentation, um, again, um, wait a little bit, don't intervene immediately. But if it doesn't get better, um, use uh, or prescribe SPF 50 and topical hydroquinone 2 to 8%. Um, you can choose rather um, for, a, for a lighter concentration in less severe cases for a higher concentration, more severe cases, and then retinol A, 0.1% topical ointment. If it doesn't improve for Fitzpatrick skin types 1 to 4 IPL, um, for higher sk um, skin types um, 4 to 6, you can use uh, ND Yak laser. Um, if you're not familiar with lasers, find a dermatologist who does it for you. Me personally, I also don't know much about lasers. I don't want to get involved with this coming from the, the, the surgical part. Um, but we do have a really good dermatologist in-house who's really um, confident in using a wide array of lasers. This can help you a lot with complications like this. Now, swelling. Swelling is um, obviously happening in most of the patients immediately, but we need to distinguish here because even though we're injecting into the buttock, we need to be aware of certain things. We need also take an, an eye on when we inject the face. If we have swelling within minutes, um, and it is also a report of itching. We can see urticaria and even angry edema. We need to be aware that this can be a type one energy reaction. If there are systemic side effects, respiratory, abdominal side effects, um, cardiovascular side effects, immediately put monitoring on the patient. Be aware that there can be an allergic reaction. Um, monitor them for 24 hours in your clinic. If you don't have a 24-hour hospital, get them hospitalized as soon as possible and run your um, medication. 
you need to have an EpiPen in your office, um, 0.3 milligrams of epinephrine are um, in the most guidelines um, recommended at the moment. Then clemestin, two to four milligrams, depending on the weight of the patient, and um, immediately start cortisone. Metoprednisolone, 125 milligrams IV. If it's not a type one allergy reaction um, with respiratory um, issues um, or abdominal side effects or cardiovascular changes, um, you can use levocetiricin, five milligrams per os. You don't need an IV. Um, however, if a patient develops signs of an allergy, I would always put an IV line as soon as possible just to be safe. And then obviously you have to prescribe prednisolone, 50 milligrams per os once a day for three days. If there is no itching, no urticaria, no angioedema, then you can assume that it's a normal swelling um, post-interventional. Um, you can prescribe cooling, cool packs. We do give our patients cooling, uh, cooling packs on a regular basis after each treatment. And in cases where you have patients that report about more um, being more prone to swelling, you can also prescribe promelaine. Um, if it doesn't get better and they still complain about swelling after three, four days, um, you have to um, also prescribe levocetirizine and prednisolone for three days. Now, in terms of nodules, um, personally, I did not see many nodules um, after injection with HA in the buttock region. We're now rather having a problem with um, PLLA in the gluteal region with nodules. But this is um, the protocol we use for nodules in the face, um, which then needs to be adapted, obviously, for the body. If they're solitary, non-fluctuating, this is really important, and there's no improvement after a couple of weeks, um, you should consider hyaluronidase, um, of course, and because of the biofilm, also prescribe antibiotics. It's really important, clindamycin, 300 milligrams, three times a day, and Cipro, um, two times a day, morning and evening. And there was already a question in the Q&A, how much hyaluronidase for 10 milliliters? This is a really rough question. I never had to dissolve a single solitary nodule of 10 cc. But um, we're speaking about 30 units for 0.1 cc in the face. So if you kind of make the, the math, um, you need 300 units for 1 ml. If we have um, 10 ml, that's going to be 3,000. That's quite a bit. Um, so I would suggest that if you start treating nodules um, after body contouring indications, get an ultrasound, evaluate the size of it before you inject too much HAs. Now, um, the intralesional hyaluronidase um, often helps for improvement. If it doesn't, you should consider intralesional steroids. Um, that's either triamcinolone, um, mix it with 2% of lidocaine and a normal physiological solution. And then you can use 0.5 ml of the solution uh, per one milliliter in the face, um, kind of adjusting that for body indications, again, depending on, on how big the bolus is that you want to treat. I wouldn't put more than 3 ml. This is already quite some bit. That's already um, one, uh, that's already 10, uh, 10 milligrams of triamcinolone. Be aware that this can cause lab atrophy. Uh, I would rather go for a smaller injection first than a second time. And if it doesn't help for a second time, don't keep on doing it because you will only end up with a lab atrophy. Change your regimen. Um, at uh, 5 fluorouracil. I never had to do it, but in the literature, it's reported that um, this might be your last resort treatment before excision. If there's a nodule, which you also don't feel reacts to any kind of treatment, sometimes before you inject too much cortisone, before you inject too much F, uh, 5-FU, just speak with the patient. And sometimes excision is the only way to, to help your patient. Obviously, if you're not a surgeon, um, you need to refer it. In terms of infection, if there is an erysipel formation, if there's cellulitis, and there's any sign of systemic infection, please do not treat it on your own. Um, this is a sure way to, to end up in the news, unfortunately. Um, if you feel that there is a systemic infection going on, immediate hospitalization. Um, this can, can escalate very quickly. Um, they need IV antibiotics, hospitalize those patients, um, even though they might refrain of going into the hospital. Um, for a minimally invasive complication, uh, make them aware that this can be really severe. If there's no sign of systemic infection, but locally, um, let's say limited, um, always ask for penicillin allergy. If they do have one, um, give them Clinda, 600 milligrams, three times a day for seven to 10 days. Do a close follow-up. In cases where there is local infection, I usually don't do a blood workup. If it gets a little bit bigger, I sometimes do check uh, leukocytes, CRP, and interleukin-6. If there's no penicillin allergy, um, you can go for amoxiclav, 875-125, uh, three times a day for seven days. 
Um, then this kind of sums up the most, let's say, frequent complications. I'm happy to discuss this with uh, both Dr. Kotti and Dr. Schlaudraff. Um, there is no more slide from my side at the point, and we are um, ready to start with the Q&A. Um, I'd quickly change our box. Um, I think you have to, uh, bioscience team, you need to take, now it works, perfect. Open this for me. Um, the first question is from Russia. Russia asks, which is more safe, filler injection or fat injection? Um, I think we kind of answered this already to a certain extent, um, but Dr. Kotti, as you, you put them next to each other, would you like to comment on that very quickly and summarize your, your points on this? Yeah, the, the, the safest technique is the technique that you master. So there is no, you can, I mean, you can do uh, accidents with both. So uh, I'm not sure the, that I can answer this technique is safer than this one. But at least I can tell you that it, we may have fat embolism and uh, death directly uh, with the BBL that we we may not face with uh, with the injection oh, unless you go directly and uh, inject uh, and 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 deep very deep, which is uh, not really the case. But for me, um, it's much better to to master the technique, rather lipofilling or uh, hyaluronic acid, and and avoid the. The, the complications because even a small complication is is a complication. Sure. Thank you so much. Then uh, from Fika, there's a question um, that he would ask. He would like to know about using hyaluronidase. How many units we need to resolve to dissolve 10 milliliters of higher carb? Uh, Dr. Staudroff, do you share my my take on that? We can kind of extrapolate what we're doing in the face, or do you have a different protocol for this? I think uh, ultimately. We've discussed this many times, also with bioscience, but with, also with other companies that actually, the problem is that there's no really systematic studies. What is the exact dosage? But on top of the exact dosage, which you can do in the lab and you put it in a in a Petri dish and you put some uh, HA in there and the hyaluronidase, then you obviously have factors, which is like how much fibrosis, how much is it encapsulated? How precise are you with, with your hyaluronidase injection are you really within the deposit or you will you just kind of like be a little bit outside of it so i do think that the best guess is what you mentioned is that we take from our face uh, experience in terms of dissolving ha and then translated it approximately to the same i do believe that uh, the trend that ultrasound assisted h hyaluronidase injection is really key because you really target your your enzyme. And I think this is the way to reduce the amount of enzyme used. I wanted to, to um, just add to the idea of the safety of the injection in terms of the comparison between fat and hyaluronic acid. I do think that there's one advantage of doing the HA injection, even though I'm a big proponent of fat injection to the buttocks, but in terms of knowing where you are, usually when you get close to the fascia, to the deep fascia, and if you're entered the muscle, since we're in a setting where we have at most local anesthetic, the patient will react, which we obviously don't have in a patient which is under general anesthesia. And that is certainly a, a safety aspect as well. Really good, really good point. Thank you so much, Dr. Schaudraff. Um, what is left in questions is also how can we handle the lack of skin laxity to reach patient satisfaction? Um, I don't know about the, the protocols or ideas in your clinics. Um, I think it was extensively pointed out by Dr. Cotti that in patients with high skin laxity, adding volume will, will not give you the certain effect. So I think this is a basic rule we, we do have in surgery. If you need a lift and add volume, you still need a lift. Um, even though this, this seems to be a little bit forgotten these days, sometimes when it comes to breast implants and also fillers in the face, um, how do you minimally invasively um, strengthen the skin? Um, do you have something where you, you feel that this works particularly well with the bioscience portfolio? Um, or do you rather stay away of those patients or rather um, send them um, for, for different treatments or make them aware that there simply cannot be done with a certain type of skin laxity? Talking with Dr. Kai or with me? Whoever wants, both of you. You, you go. 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I treated some patients like that. Uh, I usually want to avoid them when they have like a lot of skin uh, uh, looseness and they don't have a good fat uh, and they don't want to go uh, later to, to BBL or to body lift or to combo and they want only injections. And I have this experience with this lady that I, I injected like uh, for three months, uh, every three weeks. Uh, I, I tried not to exceed the 150, but we get at the end good results. Uh, I, I was quite, uh, I mean, surprised, but we put an important amount. Till now, I did not have any complication and I hope I will not get one. But uh, I believe that uh, there is no vascularization inside all these products, of course. So sooner or later, probably, if there is no encapsulation of this, uh, uh, of these hyaluronic acid amounts, uh, we may have one day uh, uh, a complication if we're going to go to big volumes. So I really want to avoid these patients if their expectations are really high. And I try to convince them rather to go to body lifting or to do other procedures. Dr. Schlaudra, any any takes on this? Um, anything to add to? I think I think uh, Borawi uh, said it perfectly. You have to manage the patient expectation and be very open with the with the advantages and disadvantage of any technique. If the patient is managed in that sense, in that sense. Uh, uh, honestly, I do think they will understand that you cannot fill a very lax skin to make it a very projected buttock, but you will need a lift in that situation. So uh, I think uh, we're surgeons, not magicians, and that's what it comes down to. I think this this summarizes this very beautifully. So um, I think for for the sake of time, we have to wrap this up. Um, but um, as this was an ISEPS um, powered webinar or endorsed webinar, I think um, this discussion should be continued um, latest in uh, Cartagena next year in Colombia at the next ISEPS meeting. Um, thank you so much, Bioscience. Thank you so much, Dr. Kotti. Thank you so much, Dr. Schlaudroff. I learned a lot from both of you. Um, I think I can speak in the name of all um, participants as well that this was really informative and we're really lucky and happy to to have you um, share your ideas and takes on this. Um, much to be discussed. I think this uh, webinar has also revealed that there are still certain parts that lack scientific evidence, as Dr. Schlaudroff has pointed out. And um, I think it's it's um, definitely a job for all of us, just like ISAPS has done with safety measurements for buttock augmentation, that we also need to work on more safer, more evidence-backed up protocols for minimally invasive buttock augmentation. So thank you so much for staying with us. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Schlaudroff. Thank you so much, Dr. Cotty. And looking forward to see you again in Cartagena for the next ISAPS meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening.